Okay, good morning everybody. Apologies for being a few minutes late. Uh, let's get started. A few housekeeping notes and then as usual we'll jump, we'll jump back uh, to lecture. Hopefully most of you have installed, run, and submitted assign, uh, Pyrosim and uh, submitted assignment one. Some people still struggling with installation issues. I know there are a few of you out there. My apologies, again, PyroSim works on Mac and Linux. It does not work for Windows. We are trying to get this fully cross-platform. We're not there yet. So for those of you that are struggling with Windows installations, if you have not yet sent me an email, please do, and we'll give you uh, an extension on assignment one. Yes? So I'm using Python 3, and I okay. had to add the little thing of like wait for this simulation. Uh, yes, that's a good point. Some of you noticed that. So if you're using PyroSim, uh, if you're using Python 3 with PyroSim, you have to put the last line, which is sim.wait to finish. And that will keep the simulation window open. So my next question is, are, yep. there, are there other quirks like that with Python 3? Like, should I bite the bullet and try to get the Python 2 one go? I, I have famous last words. I'm going to say that's the only one. We'll see. So again, please make use of the subreddit. There's a chat set up there. If there are any little wrinkles that come up, different people are using different platforms, Python 2, Python 3. We'll be using matplotlib uh, in a few weeks, which is a drawing library for Python. People may be using different versions of matplotlib. We have lots of permutations and combinations of platforms and software in this class. I can't vet every possible combination and perturbation. So if you figure something out, please write it up on the, the subreddit, email me. I'll broadcast it back out to the rest of the class and off we go. However, you should be able to use Python 3 with, with Pyrosim. Any other questions? Some of you have been struggling with the USB drives. Again, my apologies about that. I'm not sure why they are failing on us at such a high rate. Um, if you have a broken USB drive, come and see me after class. I can give you a new one. Um, some of you have moved on to a dual partition, so you can boot up your machine in either Windows or Linux, that's also fine. The third option is to create a virtual machine in running on your laptop. So if you have a Windows machine, you can start up a virtual, uh, a virtual machine which is running Linux. So your host operating system becomes Windows and your guest operating system is the virtual Linux running within Windows. Inside virtual Linux, you can then install PyroSim and run it from within uh, there. That's perfectly fine. The only drawback about a virtual machine is it usually runs a little bit slowly, which is not going to matter for your purposes for assignments one through nine. But when we get to assignment 10, things are going to become pretty computationally intensive. And then you might want to switch to either a dual boot partition or running things off the USB drive. Sound good? Any questions about assignment one? No? Okay, for the undergraduates, you're moving on to assignment two. So I just wanted to talk briefly about assignment two for a moment. Last week, we talked about the four building blocks of an evolutionary robotics experiment, the task environment that the robot lives in, the robot itself, the neural network, which serves as the brain uh, of the robot, and what's the third one that I'm missing? Task environment, robot, neural network, and evolutionary the evolutionary algorithm, which is going to sculpt, sculpt the brain, and in some cases, the body of your robot as we go ahead. The robot itself, as you will see in PyroSim, is made up of six main components. The objects, the body parts that make up the robot itself, the joints, which connect pairs of objects together. So we have objects and joints. Then we have sensors and motors. And we finished last time, uh, last week, we finished with Breitenberg vehicles that had those two light sensors on the front and two motorized wheels in the back. So obviously robots need sensors to sense their world and motors to interact with their environment. And components number five and six are neurons and synapses. So, which make up the neural network that controls the behavior of your, your robot. Four major components of a re evolutionary robotics experiment. Each robot is made up of one or more of these six component parts. In the first few assignments, 
you're basically adding in these six components to make up a very simple robot. Last time, we just made sure that you've got this virtual task environment for your robot to run about in. And now, in assignment three, four, and five, you're going to be adding in the first two, then the third and fourth, and then the fifth and sixth component. Assignment two, you're adding objects and joints. Uh, which you can see here if we jump to the subreddit for a moment at the top of the screen You'll notice uh, the assignments here objects and joints. So at the end of the objects assignment The end of the objects assignment you should have two cylindrical objects that exist in your virtual environment we're starting slow, so this is a good time to orient yourself literally and figuratively within PyroSim. We're going to orient ourselves literally. X-axis is going to be to the left and the right of the screen. Negative X is to the left. Positive X is to the right. The Z is up and down. Negative Z means under the floor. Positive Z means moving upward away from the floor. And the y-axis is into the screen and out of the screen towards you, with negative y being out of the screen towards you. By the end of this semester, this will be burned into your brain and you will never forget. As we start to add uh, more and more components to the virtual environment, you want to have panel C here uh, in the back of your mind. Some of you have already run up against issues where things are placed to the right and you expected them to be placed to the left and so on. So make sure you get this coordinate system down pat. It'll make things a lot easier for you uh, in the weeks uh, to come. Okay. One of the nice things about working with virtual robots and physics engines is most of your code, if you do it right, is visible. In this assignment, you're going to be adding a cylindrical object. The center of that object is going to be placed a certain number of units up the Z axis. So you'll know exactly where it is. You can see that the radius here is about one-tenth the length of the cylinder. If you get those numbers mixed up, you'll have a very short and a very broad cylinder, uh, and so on. So get in the habit, as you're programming up assignments two, three, and four, is when you add a piece of code, and just before you run it, in your mind's eye, you should be able to see a picture of what you expect to see. Visi every single line of code, more or less, has a visible component in PyroSim. That's true for the first few parts. Neurons and synapses, however, are invisible. You're not going to see them. They're going to be inside the robot, and they're going to be the computational part of the robot, not the physical part. But for a lot of these components, you can sort of see visually what you're doing. And hopefully, if you don't see what you're expecting to see, that should give you a hint as to where the problem is in your code. Make sense? OK. So that's objects. Uh, when you get to the uh, joints part of the assignment, you're going to be taking these two objects and connecting them together with a single rotational joint. And that joint operates very much like your elbow joint or your knee joint. It constrains the relative motion of the pairs of objects that are connected. Luckily, my lower arm cannot move independently of my upper arm, but it can rotate about a particular point, which is exactly where my elbow is. So again, although you may not be able to see the joint itself, you know where that joint is based on the relative movement of the two objects. If you place the joint in the correct position, you will see these two objects rotate relative to one another. If you place the joint in the wrong position, you will see non-physical behavior like this. Some of you, I think, have already started to stumble across that. So again, use what you see in the physics engine as a signal to you about where in your code you may have made uh, a mistake. Okay. We're making in assignments two and three the scissor bot. Um, and once you get to the end of uh, this particular part of the assignment, you'll, you should have a scissor bot that sort of folds in on itself uh, passively. This is about the simplest robot we can make. It's even simpler than a Breitenberg vehicle because we have just two objects connected by one joint. Next week, you'll be adding sensors and motors. 
to your scissor bot the week after you'll be adding neurons and synapses and when you add neurons and synapses now the robot the scissor bot is going to start acting in its environment because it's reacting to what it senses and based on what it senses it performs some actions out through its motors that's where we are with the assignments and that's where we're headed any questions yes i noticed that when we're building the, these structures here yes after a while they seem to fall over yes why do they do that if this is an ideal environment very good question so those of you that have gotten this far uh, you've got this upright scissor bot and then when you start the physics it will fall forward and it'll land like this and if you keep running the simulation it will eventually fall over to the left or the right there is no wind in this simulation there is gravity but there's no atmosphere so there is nothing that is hitting these objects and yet they will gradually fall over to the left or the right anybody have an idea why there's no noise in this environment everything is exact why would it why would there be this slight asymmetry causing it to fall over to the left or the right? Any yeah, ideas? Round off. Sorry? Computational drift round off. Yeah. Computational round off. So in when you're specifying your robot, you're not using real numbers, you're using floating point numbers, which are approximations of real numbers. All of the physics that's going on in this physics engine is pretty simple. It's Newtonian mechanics, which for our purposes is basically just F equals MA. If you think back to your high school physics, force equals mass times acceleration. The physics engine is translating masses and accelerations into forces and back again. As it's doing that, it's using floating point numbers, which are approximations. And eventually, that approximation or that inaccuracy builds up over time. It starts very, very small and gets larger and larger and larger. And you can see it eventually visibly when symmetry is broken. Something that is supposed to be perfectly symmetric, or in our case, perfectly balanced upright, will fall to the left or the right. It's a good reminder that our physics engine is not a perfect reflection of physics. It's always going to be a, an approximation of what goes on here in the real world, which is why a lot of people in my field struggle with what I, what I introduced you to last time as the reality gap. We're going to evolve robots in simulation, and those robots' experience of that physics is not exact to what they're going to experience when we 3D print them as physical robots. How do we preserve evolved behavior from a virtual world and transfer it into the real world? Not an easy thing to do. Good, good question. Any other questions before we move on? Okay, so back to lecture material. Um, we are going to finish off uh, our short history on AI and plunge into the concept of embodied cognition uh, today. Okay, so last time uh, we got, we ended with the Breitenberg vehicles, which like the scissor bot are a good place to start because they have all of, they, they have instances of the six building blocks of a robot. We have the robot's body itself, the chassis, the body part in this case. We have sensors, uh, we have joints which connect the wheels to the main body. So the wheels can rotate relative to the main body. So we have objects and joints. We have sensors. In this case, we have two of them, these light sensors which are sitting on the front of the robot. We have two motors. The motors are connected to the wheels and cause the wheels to spin. We don't have any neurons in this case, but we do have synapses. We have two of them, which are represented here as wires, and these synapses are connecting the left sensor to the right motor, and the second synapse is connecting the right sensor to the left motor, contralateral connections across the side, contralateral. And that gives us what uh, Breitenberg called vehicle 2A, or the aggressor. If you place a light anywhere in front of this robot, it will turn towards it, accelerate, and eventually smash into it. We ended last time with this robot, which is exactly the same as the aggressor, except now we have ipsilateral connections, same side connections. Left sensor to left motor, and right sensor to right motor. What does this robot do? 
It drives away from the light. So at this time instant, captured in this little cartoon here, there's more light falling on the right sensor than there is on the left <laughs> sensor, which means the right wheel spins faster than the left wheel, which means it turns away from the light and will drive a little bit away from the light. What happens a second later after it's turned away and driven away from the light by a small distance? It stops, right, because it's further away from the light. Let's assume that the light sensors on the front are omnidirectional. So it's picking up light from behind it, because now the light source is behind it. If you then chase the robot with the light from behind, what is this robot going to do? It's going to run away. So what is this robot? We have the aggressor and the... The coward, exactly, right? This robot is scared to death of light and will do anything it can to get away from light. Does the aggressor hate? Does the coward fear? Of course not, right? It's ridiculous. We love, we fear, we're different from the Bradenburg vehicle, right? Okay, you've had five days to think about it. How? Are you different from the Bradenburg vehicle? Memory. OK, this robot has no memory. We could add in a couple of neurons. And actually, we're going to see that in lecture four later this week about how to add in memory. We could add in a little bit of memory to this robot, make it a little bit more like a Turing machine. Um, the robot will adapt itself, um, or yeah, change itself to mimic the environment so that's a good point. So the, the robot, this robot doesn't change its environment. This one will. If you leave any naked light bulbs in its vicinity, it certainly will. Uh, consciousness. consciousness, right? This robot is not conscious. There's just two wires inside. There's basically nothing inside. We're conscious. We're different. OK. Anything else? The, the ability to decide to disobey, right? So this, the coward and the aggressor have no point, no choice other than to chase after or run away from lights. We can decide to face our fears and face meta, literally or metaphorically head on to something we're afraid of, right? We can choose. We have free will. No problem. We're clearly different from these simple machines. Anything else? I was going to say that we're alive. We're alive, right, absolutely. These things are dead, right? They're made out of metal and wires. That's a difference. Since the reaction to stimuli versus the uh, processing, what do you uh, These things are clearly simpler than us, right? These things have two wires, <laughs> two synapses. Most uh, adult nervous systems have about 10 to the 14 synapses. So we have way more connections than Breitenberg vehicles do. We adapt to our environment. We adapt to our environment. Again, we may not always do the same thing exposed to the, a similar situation. We can adapt. These robots can't. Lots of obvious differences between us and the Breitenberg vehicles, right? We can all relax. We're special. No problem here. There's no threat from the Breitenberg vehicles. OK, as I mentioned last time, there are 12, or there's a series of 12 Breitenberg vehicle families. We're only at two of 12. What do you think Breitenberg does with vehicles through three through 12? Makes them more complex. Makes them more complex and demolishes each and every one of the statements I've heard today. OK, whether you agree with Breitenberg or not, like last time, you may or may not agree with Searle. That's not the point. The point is to get it, the point is to clarify one of the things that's interesting about our robots is that they tend to threaten our assumptions about what makes us unique, conscious, able to make decisions, adapt, be complex, be alive. Are we so sure we know exactly what those things are? Can we specify those things so clearly? like the founding fathers of AI said, that a machine could not then simulate them. OK. Again, just food for thought. OK, another thing that's interesting about the Breitenberg vehicles, again, they're very simple. 
If you look inside them and you think now about the computational aspect of Breitenberg vehicles, they're parallel machines. The values that are flowing along the wires from the sensors to the motors are doing so in parallel, which is very different than most traditional programming. We looked at ELISA last time from the, 19, uh, from the early 1980s, uh, where we have a whole bunch of if-then-else statements. A lot of chatbots are written in exactly that way, still to date. But our simple neural network that was inside our Breitenberg vehicle before, connecting the two sensors to the two motors, is in essence a parallel uh, piece of code. Again, not unlike our brain. We have parallel circuits that are working in concert all the time. So in the 1980s, people started to propose these computational models called neural networks. They were connectionist, uh, they were known as connectionist models because we have a lot of connections between neurons, or in our case, sensors uh, and motors. And they looked, this looked a lot more like biological nerv nervous systems than this did. So there was a lot of excitement in the 1980s about uh, a lot of excitement in the 1980s about these connection, connectionist machines. Finally, in 1980, at that point, about 25 years on from the, 19, the Dartmouth conference in the 1950s, now we figured it out. These neural networks are going to do the trick. Uh, it, the 1980s turned into the 1990s, and they weren't the revolution that everybody had expected them to be. And these neural networks went out with a, uh, a vengeance, and they became very passe. Uh, people working on neural networks, their careers ended. They were basically not the way to go. However, a few researchers kept working on neural networks. And 30 years later, in 2006, there were some computational tricks that were finally worked out. And finally, neural networks started to work, and they started to realize the promise that had been made back in the 1980s. Um, the researchers who made these computational advances were, were very savvy, so they rebranded neural networks. They're now known as deep, deep neural networks, or deep networks, if you like. OK. There are other classes at UVM that, that are focused on this, but for our purposes, again, we want to notice that they are parallel. There is information flowing from the input to the output. Um, in most neural network applications, they are non-embodied, meaning that they are neural networks that are not sitting inside a robot body. Instead, we have a naked input layer here, and we present some stimulus at the input layer, like a photograph. And those pixel values from the image start to flow in this picture from the left to the right. And if you do this right, an interesting phenomenon starts to occur, which is as you train or tune these synapses or these connections, you will start to notice that neurons that are close to the input layer become sensitive to sort of small local patterns in the image, like, for example, small diagonal lines inside the image. So whenever there is a diagonal line at this particular point in the image, this particular neuron will light up. If there is not a diagonal line at that particular point in the image, it doesn't line up. So you get these low-level feature detectors. As you move up and up towards the top, or in this case, towards the right of the neural network, you see nodes that start to light up in terms of much more specific and much more global patterns. So in this cartoon here, that particular neuron only lights up when there's a face in the image, and that other neuron only lights up when there's a cat in the image. OK. In the arrows that you see here, values are flowing from the photograph that is placed at the left side of the neural network towards the right. And we get neurons lighting up saying, I see my particular pattern in the image, or I don't. What do you think happens if you stimulate one of the neural networks at the top, you clamp it to 1 rather than 0, and you allow signals to flow in the opposite direction, down towards the left side of the neural network. What do you see at the very left-hand side of the neural network? I think Google already did this. <clears throat> and it was, ended up being very bizarre and super strange. You had forms of things that were somewhat recognizable, but in odd places. And 
Exactly. So if you go Google deep dreaming after class, you can see all sorts of these kinds of crazy things, um, which is basically the neural network telling us that a cat is made up of all these different, uh, different low-level features. But if you keep stimulating this and there are signals that are flowing down and back up, these are changing and you'll see cat, a cat appear here and then a cat appear here and then a cat appear here. So everything that's coming out of here is not a static image but a continuously changing image or a video or a quote unquote dream. Kind of interesting, right? What, do we sh what, what is another thing that distinguishes us from, from Breitenberg vehicles? We dream, these things do not. No machine would ever dream seems ridiculous, right? Well, that difference, at least, has now been demolished. OK. We'll come back to talking about neural networks in two classes, uh, two classes from now. OK. So um, the pop, as I just mentioned with neural networks, which went in and out of fashion, the field of AI as a whole uh, has also gone in and out of fashion since its founding over 50 years ago. There have been two AI winters uh, so far, one in the 1970s and then one in the 1990s. The AI winter that occurred in the 1990s was because neural networks, which were promised to finally bring us AI in the 1980s, failed to do so. So the 1980s was a high summer. These new neural networks were here. They were going to solve everything. A decade later, not so much. You can go and read about the history of the, of the different AI winters if you like, kind of interesting. Clearly, we are in the middle of an AI high summer, right? It would be impossible to open up a magazine or a newspaper today and not see an article about AI or robotics. Everyone in the field and outside of the field is asking, how long is this summer going to last? Who knows? We'll see. Is a third winter on the way? Who knows? Hans Moravec was a very famous roboticist back in the 1980s, and he described uh, some of these AI winters that had occurred in the past. Uh, many researchers were caught up in a web of increasing exaggeration about what their AI algorithms could do. They made promises to DARPA, which is the Defense Advanced Research Projects Agency. DARPA is the research wing of the US Department of Defense, which, as you can imagine, funds a lot of robotics and AI research uh, in the US. If you want money from DARPA, you have to promise them that your algorithm or your robot is going to finally exhibit much more intelligent, intelligence than machines that came before. And of course, whatever you promise this year, you have to promise at least that much the next year, right? And so you get into this feedback cycle, which again, speaking as someone who proposes ideas to NSF and DARPA and so on, that is definitely just as real today as it was in the 1980s. So uh, the history of AI is very interesting, and the present day of AI is also very interesting because we're at this peak of high summer. Everyone is very excited and also very worried about what AI can currently do and what it may be able to do in the next few years. OK, so that's where we are with AI at the moment. Uh, again, this has been a very shallow treatment of the history uh, of AI. I've touched briefly on some of these different branches of approaches to making intelligent uh, machines. We just talked about connectionism, these neural networks. Computational neuroscience, these are people that are trying to create even more biologically realistic models of biological brains. Obviously, neural networks share some resemblance to uh, biological nervous systems. Both have neurons and synapses, but that's about where the similarity ends. We can make much more biologically realistic models if we want. That's what computational neural scientists uh, do. Most of you have probably heard of machine learning, and data mining, um, mining vast amounts of data, looking for patterns, uh, finding patterns in large amounts of raw data. That is obviously an important component of intelligence, belongs with AI uh, and robotics. We're going to talk in this course about evolutionary computation, which is a different kind of machine learning algorithm, clearly based on the idea of Darwinian descent with modification. However, we're going to spend most of our time uh, in this course in the upper right part uh, of this landscape in evolutionary robotics. We looked at industrial robotics last time. This is more or less a solved problem. You have a human who sits down and programs 
a robot to do exactly the same thing over and over again. We're very good at that now. I mentioned bio-robotics or bio-inspired robotics last time. We might look at a particular animal or the human species and try and build that product of evolution into metal. Evolutionary robotics, instead of trying to build a particular product of evolution, we're trying to build or replicate the process of evolution. So a lot of the robots that are produced by our evolutionary algorithms, sometimes they look like animals that we see in nature, sometimes not. We'll talk a little bit in this course about developmental robotics. Developmental robotics is kind of the sister discipline to evolutionary robotics. Development here means human development, the way in which humans gradually grow from infants into an, an adult. You are all intelligent adults. You didn't all acquire your intelligence at a single point in time. It was a gradual process. You learned some things before others because there is a natural progression about how to learn things. Maybe we can replicate that in machines. Rather than evolving machines to treat a machine as a human infant, it may know a few things, but not a lot of things. And then how do we gradually get that baby robot to acquire more and more skills as it goes so that it starts to exhibit more and more aspects of human intelligence? Related to evolutionary robotics, not quite the same thing. Swarm robotics, kind of uh, self-explanatory. How do we get groups of intelligent actors, or machines in this case, to work well together so that the swarm can achieve some task that would be difficult or impossible for one complex machine to perform on its own? You'll notice that there are two main branches in this sketch of the landscape of AI and robotics. What's the difference, the one main difference between these two branches? Embodied versus non-embodied. Non Everything over here, are these are intelligent algorithms, but they lack a body. Everything above the line has some body, and for the, our purposes for the moment, a body is a tool with which to push against the world, literally or figuratively, and observe how the world pushes back. And that feedback loop of interacting with the world for embodied machines like robots and animals and humans, that feedback loop becomes the raw material we use to learn about our world and how to affect it in the way we want to affect it. So we're going to switch now and talk about this idea of embodied cognition in a little bit more detail. Um, we're obviously going to spend our time working with embodied machines. As I mentioned before, there are already other courses here at UVM that focus on non-embodied approaches to AI. Question. So how did, I guess, ubiquitous computing fit in there? Like, what did it uh, mean a little bit of both? Good question. Ubiquitous computing. So we're in the process of distributing machines and stitching them into our environment. Are those embodied or non-embodied machines? <coughs> what do you all think? Okay. Again, right? They need to have something with which they can push against the world and observe how the world pushes back. There are probably at least 50 smartphones in this room at the moment. They're communicating with some satellites up in up in orbit. If we take that network as a whole, is it embodied? It's physical, right? It exists. It has a body. It has a physical body, but is it embodied? I mean, the, so people do things based on what their mobile devices tell them. So that could be the pushback, and then it also takes input depending on what people type into their phone. Absolutely, right? So there's a feedback loop between your phone and you. For your phone, its environment mostly is you, right? Okay, let's explore that. The ubiquitous computing and smartphones, it's a good example to keep in the back of your mind as we look in a little more detail about what exactly we mean by this idea of embodiment. Okay. We're going to explore this idea of embodiment by looking at some of the building blocks of intelligence. As we saw in the last lecture, it's very difficult to define exactly what we mean by intelligence. 
Okay, according to Alan Turing, it was impossible. What we can do instead is try and identify the building blocks of intelligence. We can say an agent that is not able to do X and Y and Z is less intelligent than a machine or an organism that can do X and Y and Z. We could argue about what those building blocks are, but let's start with some of them that are pretty obvious. We just talked about deep networks and machine learning. Obviously, one of the building blocks of intelligence is pattern recognition, right? There, is a, there are a whole number of photons falling on my retinas right now, but I don't see the retinas. I see students and desks and chairs and pens and so on. The raw data that's arriving at my, uh, at my uh, visual sense organs is being transformed somehow by my brain into structure. It's pulling the pattern out of the raw data. How does my brain do that? Again, that was a very mysterious concept for a long time. And the deep learning revolution sort of figured out how to get machines to do this, which is why I've crossed out the is here. It was one of the most difficult problems in computer science. We're going to look at a particular aspect of pattern cognition here in a moment. We're going to look at some other building blocks of intelligence. And for each of these building blocks, we're going to look at a non-embodied approach to get a machine to do it. And then we're going to look at an embodied approach to get a machine to do it. We're going to look at non-embodied and embodied approaches to x. Let's start with pattern recognition. Very difficult, um, and nobody realized how difficult it was for a long time, because obviously if you look at this picture, in the panel in the top left, you see... Okay, good, people still recognize Marilyn Monroe. That's good, all right. For most of you, it should have happened, it should have felt instantaneous, right? It didn't take much cognitive effort to recognize, first of all, that there was a human in this picture, and then who, who that human was. It turns out to get machines to do that was notoriously difficult. It took us from 1956 to 2006 to figure out how to do that. There's lots of ways of approaching this problem. Let's start with image segmentation. There's a background and a foreground in this picture. I want you to label every pixel as either belonging to the foreground or the background. Again, that's an oversimplification. There's mid-ground as well, and texture, and 3D structure, and so on. But just find the thing in the picture, whatever it is. The thing that stands out from the background. And the other three panels here are showing a machine trying to do this. And it's actually doing it pretty well. Right? It's very difficult to do that. We can now do that today in 2006. In order to get a machine to do this, you need millions of photographs, and you need thousands upon thousands of computers to train a deep neural network to do this. It takes a lot of computational effort to make this happen if you don't have a body. If you have a body, you, you can avail yourself of your body, which is a tool to learn about the world. And it turns out that if you use your body in the right way, you can solve the image segmentation problem much easier. It takes much less effort to do so. So that's one of the first lessons we can take away from embodied cognition. The body is not a dirty, messy thing that's in the way of the soul like Descartes taught us. It's not a hindrance. It's a tool. It actually makes things easier. OK. Let's have a look at BabyBot here. You can go and read the research paper that describes BabyBot in more detail. We're going to just use this cartoon here and only talk about some elements of this experiment. As you see here, BabyBot is somewhat humanoid. It has two eyes or two cameras, and it has a movable arm. The three panels that you see at the very right side of the slide is a cartoon representation of what BabyBot sees as BabyBot starts to move its arm into its visual field. In the little uh, images that you'll see there, the arm is drawn and everything else is kind of grayed out. What the researchers did in this case is to take the two raw feeds coming from the camera and they tagged pixels in that, in that video feed with a binary value. Zero represents that there is no motion going on in that uh, pixel, and a one represents that there is some motion being detected in that pixel in that point in time. 
So they're throwing away color, they're throwing away grayscale, and they're reducing these two images, they're combining them and reducing it to a single binary image. What in the image is moving and what is not? So the grayed out stuff is the robot saying there's nothing moving there at the moment, and this uh, blob from the robot's left visual field, that whatever that blob is, it's in motion. Okay. So BabyBot, as the name implies, is actually an experiment from developmental robotics. Development, studying how human infants grow into human adults. So we're actually looking at a developmental process here, not an evolutionary process. We have BabyBot, which is a baby. It doesn't know much. The only thing BabyBot knows is that it can send commands to its motors. And when it does, its arm will do this. That's pretty much all BabyBot can do. And when it does that, or when it fails to do nothing, or when it does nothing, it's still getting this visual feedback. Is BabyBot embodied? It clearly has a physical body, but is it embodied in the way that we're interested in? How so? Because it's using its head as a point of reference for identifying movement. OK, so the baby bot can move its arm. It can act on the world, which in this case is not doing too much at the moment. It can move its arm, and it can sense the repercussions of its action. If its arm enters its visual field, it will see that blob. I'm using the term blob because the baby bot doesn't even know that it has an arm yet. It's very, it has very limited knowledge. OK, so baby bot, uh, like a baby, is curious. So it doesn't know much. If you want to learn about things, you might as well just start acting. Let's see what happens. So it sends some commands to its arm. And suddenly, this blob enters its field of view. And then, by chance, it stops moving its arm. What happens? What does it see? The motion stops, right? Suddenly the blob disappears. The robot moves, it, sends commands to its motors again, and suddenly the blob reappears. What can BabyBot learn from that? What does it know about the blob? That the blob is part of itself? Uh, maybe. <laughs> Maybe it controls it. There is, a, there is some relationship. If I do this, I see that. That's pretty much all it knows. If it wants to call the blob self, OK. What else does BabyBot know about this blob? It moves when it fires its motors. It moves, right? So when it fires its motors, the blob doesn't stay in the same place. The, the blob changes in the robot's field of view. So whatever this thing is, let's call it self for the moment. BabyBot says, I'm going to call this thing self. And this thing, whatever this thing is, it moves whenever I send commands to my motors. And it disappears when I stop sending commands to my motors. So it's already starting to learn something about this thing called self. What else can BabyBot deduce about this thing called self? It can only see things that are moving. BabyBot doesn't know that, though. We're, all it does is get this raw, sensor, this raw sensor feed, and sometimes things appear, some things disappear. That's it. That's just given to the robot. Yes? I'm not exactly how to word it, but it, um, pixels that are adjacent on the cell are on the view of another object. It can see that moving, too. Possibly. It hasn't. We haven't gotten to the bottom right yet, though. It hasn't, the self hasn't touched any adjacent <coughs> objects yet. We're just seeing this. What else can it tell about the blob? Remember, we're throwing away color, so it doesn't know anything about the color of the blob. It knows the blob moves and disappears when it does certain things. What else does it know about the blob? OK, so this, it knows the approximate size. And the size stays more or less constant. right? It may move its arm toward itself and away from itself, in which case the size would change. But more or less the size and the shape of the blob stays constant. So it's already starting to learn about this thing called self. Generally speaking, it maintains the same shape. 
same size but might change position. All right, let's carry on. BabyBot continues to move this thing called self and suddenly something very surprising happens. The blob changes shape, or sorry, self changes shape. Hasn't seen that before. What happens now? Let's say BabyBot touches this apple pretty fast and then stops moving its arm. What happens? Possibly. So maybe it touches it. Maybe suddenly the shape changes and suddenly the relative motion of self slows a little bit. That's possible. Yeah. So what you've said so far is that uh, baby bot is only aware of things that are in motion. It's only aware of things that are in motion. So it That's touches right. the apple and yep. the apple settles. So suddenly self got bigger and then suddenly self got smaller and air just doesn't exist anymore because your arm stops moving. Kind of mysterious, right? So suddenly, actually, now the blob got bigger. You stop moving the arm. So the arm disappears. The, sorry, self disappears. What about the apple? Well, the blob's only as big as it moves in one direction. Possibly, yeah. In this little cartoon here, yeah, as long as there are these pieces of fruit in its line of action. The apple might keep moving even if it's not firing rotors. Ah, uh, now there's something really surprising from Baby Bot's point of view. From its life experience so far, things only move and disappear when commands are sent to the motors. But now there was a thing that wasn't there before. Now suddenly it's there, and even when Baby Bot stops moving its arms and self disappears, this thing keeps moving. Baby Bot says, that's very interesting. I've never seen that before. So that blob over there is non-self. That's the difference. There are certain things that I have control over and other things which I have limited control over. I got the ball rolling in this case, but I didn't stop it. It has some momentum of its own. One of the most important things that an intelligent actor in the world needs to figure out is where self ends and non-self begins. There, I have control more or less over this stuff, not so much over this stuff. Again, like recognizing Marilyn Monroe in the image, for most of us that seems so obvious, it seems ridiculous to even be talking about it from our point of view. However, going back 20 or 30 or 40 years, you struggled with the same issue. There were a whole bunch of blobs in your environment. Everything was chaotic. But gradually, these blobs settled into these two important classes, things I have control over and those I don't. So BabyBot is, of course, solving the image segmentation problem here. It's relatively easy because when it moves, suddenly it gets the outline of the shape against background, which is all the stuff that's not moving. But we've also now gone quite a bit beyond image segmentation. And BabyBot, by interacting with the world, is generating a lot of raw data from which it can start to learn a lot of things about itself and the world. We've got to the point where BabyBot is able to distinguish between self and non-self. What else can it start to learn about these non-self things? What happens if it pushes against the banana, unlike the apple? The banana is not going to roll. The banana is not going to roll. What is Baby Bot? What can, so some things roll and some things don't. So maybe Baby Bot says, I'm going to come up with a new word called roll. And certain objects have this property and some don't. Ah, so this property roll is somehow related to this other property, which I'm going to call shape. So now BabyBot is armed with some different concepts, self, non-self, shape, and rolling. And it's starting to learn that there are relationships between these things. What else can it learn? If, um, if the fruit doesn't keep moving after BabyBot touches it, could it confuse the fruit to be part of itself? Possibly. If, for example, some of this fruit sticks to the hand, now it becomes, from Baby Bot's point of view, self. Right? So there's definitely some confusing things that can happen here. What else can Baby Bot learn about the world just by playing with bananas, apples, and bunches of grapes that we set in front of it? Yes? Uh, 
the laws of motion, right? Some things roll faster than others. We mentioned resistance on the motor. Things that tend to be bigger blobs tend to take more force to move them. So BabyBot says, I'm going to introduce a new concept called mass or heaviness, right? So it's starting to learn not just about shape and geometry and very abstract concepts like self and non-self. BabyBot is also, like human infants, a scientist. It's starting to law learn about the basic laws of physics that at least apply at our scale in space and time. Yes? What about color? What about color? can't learn about color because we've thrown that all away, right? So there are a lot of things that we've hidden from BabyBot. We could imagine turning the color back on and it might learn uh, that colors are associated with other uh, properties and so on. There's dozens of things that BabyBot could learn about the world around it in addition to the things we've talked about. Let's do one more. Ah, so can BabyBot get to numeracy? Can it start to discover numbers? How might it do so? Um, so we're realizing that there are like several different objects on the table with different <clears throat> shapes. There's like the apple shaped form and the orange shaped form. Uh, absolutely, right? So it may learn that if there are two apples in a row, they're still rollable. But if there's three end to end, there's too much mass and friction and they won't roll. So above this thing, let's call it three. There's no more rolling, at least for these round things. Could it learn to tell by like knowing the length of its arm and like how long is that apple or the length of its arm or something? Like that? Maybe, maybe. It's possible. It's interesting again to think about all of the things that humans pride themselves on being able to do, like number and language. Could you get to them from these very nuts and bolts, Newtonian mechanics things? I push and things roll or don't roll. Object permanence. Object permanence. What's object permanence? So like in human development, you don't develop this to like, I don't know what age, but you like develop the ability to know that things exist even though you can't see them. So like when, when like, like if you cover up your face, like, like a baby, you like to see your, Absolute object permanence is an important lesson, right? Assuming that these objects keep rolling, they're, they're still there. So BabyBot, like a human infant, will learn pretty quickly that things don't magically disappear and appear again, with the exception of things like self, if the, if the motion turns on. So human infants, regardless of the culture that they come from around the world, love to play peekaboo. Why do kids love to play peekaboo so long, uh, so well? Because there's something in them that is trying to figure out this object permanence thing. I saw this thing disappear, but wait a second, it didn't disappear. That's surprising, it makes me laugh. Eventually, kids will get bored of peekaboo. When they get bored of peekaboo, that's the moment when they've learned object permanence. This is no longer funny because I know that there is a face behind the occluding hands. It's not interesting anymore. Uh, rigid, like not all objects are rigid. Uh, you find that out when touching the grapes. When touching the grapes, or maybe it decides to go like this instead of like this. So far, most blobs maintain the same shape, but there are certain actions I can perform that will change the shape of some of these objects. So I'll, I'll come up with this new concept called squishability, right? So again, you can, there's a lot of things that BabyBot can learn, even in this very, very simple environment. And the way that it's learning all of these things is not by passively sitting there and observing apples and grapes and bananas. It's through action, pushing against the world, in this case, literally, and, as you, and observing how the world pushes back. That's embodiment. OK. Everyone who works in robotics more or less adheres to this approach to creating intelligent machines. Start by getting them to do simple physical things and learning about those simple physical things. And they can then build on top of that increasingly abstract concepts like number, for example. OK, so that's pattern recognition. Let's look at another element of uh, intelligence, which is planning. Any agent, uh, biological or artificial, that cannot plan into the future is to some degree a uh, an agent with limited intelligence. Right? 
If you can't plan into the future, you're always being surprised, right? And that's very difficult to adapt and deal with the world if you're constantly surprised. People have been working on planning again since the beginning in 1956. Um, again, a few decades later, there were some big steps forward made with planning where we could get a computer to plan ahead, for example, in chess, and it could plan ahead so well that it was able to defeat uh, the grand champion at that time. What was that time? Any chess aficionados here? When did this occur? 70s, 80s, 90s? <laughs> Not bad. Yep, exactly. So mid-1990s, we had a machine that could plan ahead better than a human, <coughs> at least when we were dealing with a game like chess. Checkers was solved in the 1980s. Chess was solved in the 1990s. When was Go solved, more or less? Was it like 2015? Was it? I'm losing count now. Very recently, right? OK. Everyone was very excited in 2016 uh, when, a, when a machine could finally beat humans at Go. There was just as much excitement in the 1990s when a computer defeated the chess champion. There was also a fair bit of excitement in the 80s when a computer could play a good game uh, of checkers. What's next? The Terminator, human level intelligence, right? We're done. The most complex game that humans know of, Go, more or less, a, com uh, a robot can do it, or a computer can do it. Jeopardy was a Jeopardy Watson. Jeopardy Watson, right, you got the shirt on right there, exactly. So Jeopardy is kind of interesting. How is Jeopardy the outlier compared to Checkers, Chess, and Go? Okay. A very different kind of game, right? Jeopardy is definitely less structured than these games, but more structured than a casual conversation. The innovation was the language parsing. The language parsed the, the clues. Exactly. It was able to parse the clues and sort of find out the hidden structure in, in Jeopardy. But Watson, at least not yet, is, is not able to have a casual conversation and pass the Turing test. So there still is some gap between these things. And what that gap is, again, is sort of hard to define. So we've made a lot, of, a lot of progress. It's been very exciting. But often in the excitement, like we were just talking about AI winters and summers, often in the excitement, we lose track of the progress that we're making. Are we really making significant progress or not? OK. That's planning. So this is non-embodied planning. So Deep Blue was able to beat Kasparov by basically thinking about chess moves into the future, didn't really need a body, non-embodied planning. Before we talk about an embodied approach to planning, let's pause for a moment and take a little bit of a detour into a different cognitive ability. Somebody mentioned that we're different from Vreitenberg vehicles because we're conscious. We have free will. We can choose not to obey. We can choose not to chase the light source, right? OK. Let's have a look at free will for a moment. This is a very uh, famous and controversial experiment from the early 80s by Libet and his colleague. This was a uh, neuroimaging uh, study. They took a number of human subjects. They placed uh, an EEG cap on their head. What does EEG stand for? Yep, electroencephalography, so measuring the electric potential uh, on the surface of the brain. EEG is not so good about picking up electrical signals deep in the brain, but it can get a lot of the surface, which is good news for us because most of the abstract thinking, the human type of thinking, planning, uh, reasoning, mathematics, language, a lot of that is on the sur takes place on the surface of the brain. So we can capture a lot of that. So they instrumented each human subject with an EEG cap, and then they placed a little EMG strap on their finger. What's EMG? What do you think the M stands for? Motor or myo. So in this case, it's electromyography. So for each, patient, uh, each subject here, they're gonna get back two streams of data. Electrical activity from the brain, and electrical activity from the muscle in the finger, which occurs exactly when the finger starts moving. So they're going to capture thought and action. 
So far, so good? Okay. They gave the following instructions to the human subjects. They put a, f a clock in front of the subjects, and there was a moving red dot that moved at the speed of the second hand. They asked the subjects to arbitrarily decide at any given time, it was up to them, they could freely choose when to do so, to move their finger. So if I am uh, if I'm in the experiment, I'm watching the I'm watching it move, and then when it reaches eight, I decide to move my finger and I move my finger. That's the idea. So we have different subjects, and they're choosing at different times when to move their finger, and they were given very strict instructions to try not to cheat the experiment. When you decide to move your finger, move your finger at exactly that time, and then tell us. Where exactly was the red dot when you made that decision? Turns out that it seems most of the subjects were honest because when they said they made the decision, there was a particular pattern that occurred in their brain. So they, each subject did this multiple times and chose to move their finger at different points in time. But at each of those reported points of time, there was this common pattern for that subject. So whenever they said they decided to move their finger, there was a, a pattern that could be found in the EEG data. Of course, that pattern was different for different subjects. So your EEG patterns are just as distinctive as your, your thumbprints. But it was robust, or it was the same pattern within the same subject when they did this experiment multiple times. So far, so good? At each of those points in time, about 200 milliseconds later, the EMG sensor chirped, saying two tenths of a second after the subject said they decided to move their finger, their finger actually moved. No problem so far, right? This all seems to make sense. Turns out that in most of the cases, there was another EEG pattern, which again, was robust, it was the same within the subject when they did this experiment multiple times, but that pattern always appeared 300 milliseconds before the subject said that they had decided to move their finger. So what? That's, that, uh, that's put very well. Something in their unconscious, they didn't know it because they said they made the decision at eight seconds, but really at 7.7 uh, .7 seconds, there was something else that seemed to be triggering the decision. But if they weren't conscious of it, if it was happening in their unconscious, how can that be a freely made decision? It's your unconscious that's making it. And the definition of your unconscious is you don't really have any control over it. So who is making the decision? If you believe you have free will, this is the time to defend it. Otherwise, you're in trouble. I kind of like the argument that the, the consciousness can reject an unconscious decision. Ah, OK, OK. If you can want to move your finger unconsciously, realize that it's like, no, actually, I'm not going to move my finger. That's possible, right? So there are a lot of rebuttals to the paper since then. There have also been many more papers that have tried to do this experiment in different ways. And you can go and read the literature on this. The easiest way to do it is to go to Google Scholar and type in Libet 1983, which will give you back this paper, and that's a starting point. And you can then follow forward in time to all of the papers that cite this paper that either try and refute it or provide additional evidence in favor of it. My personal reading of the literature is there is much more evidence in favor of Libet and all the other approaches than there is against it. Again, I'm not trying to convince you that you don't have free will. The point for today is that there is growing evidence in the literature saying you do and you don't. We all feel like we do. If you ignore the Libet experiment and the recent literature on this, it seems obvious we have free will. We freely make decisions. I decide to end class on time or a few minutes early. It's up to me. I can make decisions. The Breitenberg vehicles cannot, right? That's something that distinguishes us.
The point of this little departure for us is to remind ourselves that thinking about thinking is misleading. And then you'll hear this slogan throughout this course. If we just observe our own behavior or you watch yourself think, it's known as metacognition, you cogitate about your own cognition, you often come to very erroneous conclusions. Things that seem obvious when you introspect, when you put them under the microscope or you put humans under the microscope, or as we're going to do in this course, you put robots under the microscope, often the evidence makes things a little bit more blurry. It's not as obvious anymore that we have free will, that we make decisions, that we are different from the Breitenberg vehicles. Whether we are or not, again, is not the point of, of this course. Just to remind you that this can be a little bit tricky. OK, let's back up for a moment. Uh, any other questions? Actually, before we do that, any more questions about the Libet experiment? Oh, I, just, I like the quote of, I have to believe that I have free will because I don't have a choice. I have to believe that I have free will because I don't have a choice. Because I don't have a choice. I also like that one. That's, that's a good one. It's just curious. Uh, so again, there, there is this vast field of developmental psychology where they, like BabyBot actually, they try and infer what babies are learning in the very, uh, in the very beginning uh, of life, and it's a fascinating literature, a little bit outside what we're going to talk about here. But again, if you're interested, go and Google developmental psychology, a lot of interesting things to read about there. Okay, so um, back to embodiment. We just looked at non-embodied non planning like Deep Blue, which says if I move my knight, he might move his bishop, which would then allow me to move my queen and checkmate him, right? Planning into the future. What does embodied planning look like? Here's basically the first example. This is Shaky the robot. It's not an evolved robot. It's not a developing robot. This robot is all built by hand. Um, it was built and tested at Stanford in the 60s uh, and 70s. And Shaky uh, did the following, as you can see in the picture here. It's moving about in a room. You'll notice that there's some actual desktop computers that are inside uh, Shaky. This was amazing at the time that there was actually a computer on board a mobile robot in the late 60s. Cutting edge at the time. Using those onboard computers, Shaky would scan its environment with a laser rangefinder, not that different from autonomous cars. It would build up an internal model, a representation of itself. Again, this is just a cartoon on the right here. Given that internal model, it would then plan an escape route. So they'd put Shaky in this room and say, Shaky, go out through the open door. So obviously it couldn't head straight for the door. It had to model all of the obstacles between itself and the door and plan an escape route. It would take a few minutes to build this model and do this plan. Then it would move, stop, update its model, update its escape route, move, model, plan, move, and so on. Why was it called Shaky the Robot? Absolutely. So when, if you watch the old videos of Shaky, it sort of shakes and moves it and then comes to rest, moves, shakes, and so on. Okay. Is this how you get about your world? Remember, thinking about thinking is misleading. We're going to finish in two minutes' time, at which time you're going to pack up and head for the door. Are you doing this? I hear one yes. Any no's? Who knows? Okay. This is a, a, an approach to planning, but it's not very satisfying somehow. Why not? Well, for me, it's not entirely clear like what the planning is. So there's very algorithmic planning, but that doesn't seem to be what humans are doing. True. We ha I, obviously, I'm hiding a lot of the details here. It comes up, it plans this sort of trajectory towards where it wants to go, and then takes a small step along that trajectory. Not very satisfying. Why? Yeah, I think it's like 
maybe you could argue that it flies by the seat of its pants. I would argue kind of the opposite, right? This is a very nervous robot. Most of the time, it's staying still and thinking and not moving. Exactly, right? So you've sat in thousands of lecture rooms and left thousands of lecture rooms. You've got muscle memory about how to navigate the desks and your fellow students and get out the door, right? It's all just kind of, kind of there. Think again about an evolutionary approach to this. Imagine our distant ancestors in the woods where most of the time they didn't move and they were spending most of their time thinking about what to do next. What do you think happened to those distant ancestors? Not a great strategy. There are times to think and times to act. Now, again, we're not really being fair to Shaky here. He's using 1960s technology. With 2019 technology, we can probably spin around and around this feedback loop where we push against the world. Shaky moves and observes the repercussions of its actions much faster. Still not very satisfying. On Thursday, we'll see why, and we'll continue on our discussion about embodied and non-embodied cognition. You have a quiz due tonight. Um, I posted assignment uh, two for the undergraduates and assignments three and four for the graduate students. See you on Thursday. <laughs>